The camera opens over Europe, 1943. The horizon is bruised with gray, clouds shredded by wind, and two German engineers stand on a ridge near Augsburg, binoculars lifted against the glare. Far above, dots emerge, B-24 liberators, moving in perfect formation, sunlight flashing across their bellies. One of the men counts the engines. Then it comes, a howl from the heavens, a metallic scream that doesn't fade with distance but sharpens, slicing through the cold air like a blade. The younger man drops his field glasses, pressing both palms to his ears. The elder shouts over the noise, Was is thus? It isn't the sound of bombs, nor of guns. It is the sound of turbines spinning at the edge of physics, of exhaust gases turned into power, of machines forcing air to obey. The air trembles with control. The Germans, veterans of the Messerschmitt factories, know the voice of an engine in pain. But this, this isn't pain, it's purpose. In the control tower of the bomber leading the formation, Captain Edward H. Lawson from Wichita, Kansas, pushes the throttles forward. His logbook later notes, engines steady, altitude 29800, turbos singing. Below him, flak bursts in black blossoms, but the aircraft keeps climbing, untouched by the thinness of air. The two German engineers watch as contrails twist into silver ribbons. The sound fades, leaving only the whisper of wind across the hill. One mutters, that shouldn't be possible. The other remains silent, staring at the sky where power had a voice. They don't yet know that what they heard was not chaos, but control, precision, and belief made audible. That scream would soon haunt them, a sound born not from rage, but from understanding the air itself. And for 30 seconds, the audience is frozen with them, caught between awe and disbelief, as the sky itself seems to speak. If you value stories like this, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps preserve forgotten chapters of history. Tell us where you're watching from and what time it is there. History, after all, belongs to every hour of the world. In 1942, deep inside a gray hall of the Luftwaffe Research Institute at Stuttgart, a group of engineers huddled around a wooden table cluttered with blueprints and ashtrays. The topic that morning, a captured technical report describing something the Americans called a turbo supercharger. It spoke of exhaust gases driving a turbine that compressed air back into the engine, a circle of energy that on paper seemed absurd. Dr. Heinrich Adler, the senior engineer, tapped his cigarette and scoffed. Air compressing air, he said, it's like trying to lift yourself by your own belt. Laughter rolled across the table. Perhaps they think heat is infinite, one added. The meeting adjourned with smirks and jokes about Yankee fantasies. Thousands of miles away, in the raw deserts of New Mexico, that fantasy roared to life. At the General Electric test site near Albuquerque, engineers in oil-stained overalls ran a B-17 engine mounted on steel beams. The exhaust pipes glowed orange, feeding a turbine that spun so fast the air around it shimmered. The thermometer climbed past 1,600 degrees. A test note scribbled by engineer Claire Johnson read, if the sun had lungs, it would sound like this. The Germans saw air as resistance. The Americans saw it as opportunity. They had learned to trap the wind, turning waste into movement, chaos into climb. At right field, Colonel Donald Kiern, overseeing tests, told his men, if we can breathe where they can't, we win. That year, production plans shifted quietly. Factories in Lynn, Massachusetts, and Schenectady began machining compressor wheels the size of dinner plates, each with a tolerance no thicker than a sheet of paper. GE filed 26 patents in 12 months. By spring 1943, every B-17 and B-24 leaving the line at Willow Run carried a turbocharger capable of holding power at 30,000 feet. Back in Stuttgart, Adler's assistant, a young engineer named Franz Kessler, kept one of those American reports folded inside his coat. Late one night, he whispered to a colleague, they're not chasing speed, they're chasing altitude. He was right. While the Reich pushed for more horsepower on the ground, America built engines that climbed above the weather, above the guns, above reach. The difference was not arrogance, but imagination. The ability to believe that even wind could be tamed. And somewhere between those two worlds, the balance of the air war began to tilt. By 1943, the war had pulled every corner of America into motion. 
In Utah, where mountains cut the horizon clean and the air smelled of copper and sweat, a sprawling complex rose from the desert dust, the Hillfield Turbo Manufacturing Plant. It was neither glamorous nor famous, but its heartbeat never stopped. Inside, rows of women in denim uniforms bent over benches assembling turbine blades smaller than their palms. Sparks leapt, welding arcs hissed, and the clang of metal echoed like industrial thunder. Above the factory floor, a banner read, Every turn means a climb. Beneath it, 19-year-old machinist Eleanor Price adjusted her goggles and fed another housing into the grinder. Her diary that night simply said, The noise feels like the sky already screaming. Each turbocharger had 135 parts, blades of nickel-chromium steel, bolts treated to withstand 700 degrees C's, and precision-milled impellers balanced within a single gram. At full speed, one turbine spun faster than 18,000 revolutions per minute. One spark out of place could mean an explosion. One perfect weld could mean a bomber flying higher than any fighter. By June, the factory produced 40 units a day. Trains loaded with wooden crates marked AIR material, handle like hearts, rolled east toward Michigan, where Ford's Willow Run plant was assembling a B-24 every 63 minutes. Numbers like that didn't just win wars, they redefined what a nation could do when it refused to sleep. The camera lingers on Eleanor again, wiping sweat from her forehead as her supervisor checks a finished turbine. She smiles faintly. They'll never know who made this sound, she says, tightening the bolts, but they'll hear it. Outside, the night shift begins. Floodlights turn the entire valley white. Snowflakes drift through the air, melting before they touch the metal roofs. Somewhere beyond those clouds, engines are waiting to be born. Each scream at 30,000 feet would start here, not in laboratories or command rooms, but in the calloused hands of workers who believed that precision could be a kind of patriotism. In the summer of 1944, a crippled B-24 named Lucky Penny went down near Castle, Germany. Its wings were torn open by flak, one engine on fire, the other still spinning as it vanished into the trees. When the smoke cleared, German recovery teams found the wreck intact enough to study. Engineers from Junkers and Daimler-Benz arrived days later, guarded by Wehrmacht soldiers who could barely hide their curiosity. They pried open the scorched nacelle. Inside, they saw something strange, a compact metal spiral, blackened yet unbroken. It wasn't part of any supercharger they knew. One of the men whispered, it burned, but it didn't break. The team spent hours dismantling it piece by piece until they found the heart of the system, a waste gate valve, heat stained but still functional, regulating the flow of exhaust with automatic precision. The inscription on the plate read, General Electric, Lynn Mass, at USA. In their notes that night, an engineer named Otto Klein wrote, they built a machine that forgives heat, forgives imbalance, as if it were built for humans, not perfection. He underlined the word forgives twice. German technology had always prized control through rigidity. This device achieved control through resilience. It bent, but did not break. At a debriefing later that week, Klein presented his findings to a Luftwaffe colonel. Their turbine endures heat beyond 1,700 degrees, he explained, holding up a warped but working impeller. The colonel frowned. And ours? Klein hesitated. Ours gives up at 1,300. What unsettled the room was not just the numbers. It was the idea that American engineers had embraced imperfection as a design philosophy. They allowed metal to breathe, to expand, to recover. It was a technology that mirrored the people who made it. Adaptive, flexible, almost forgiving. One older German, tracing the melted edge of the turbine housing, muttered quietly, we built machines to dominate. They built machines to endure. His words hung heavy over the silent workshop. That night, as bombs echoed in the distance, Otto Klein stood outside and looked at the glow of Allied searchlights flickering on the clouds. For the first time, he wondered if the war had already been lost. Not on the battlefield, but inside the minds of men who believed steel could be proud. Spring 1945. The war was ending, but in the dusty heart of Texas, the air still hummed with engines. At Camp Hearn, a small group of captured Luftwaffe technicians had been assigned to light maintenance work. Among them was Carl Brenner, 
once an engineer at Messerschmitt's Augsburg plant, now prisoner number 24799. One afternoon, he was escorted to a nearby airfield for what the Americans called a demonstration. He expected humiliation, propaganda, or worse. Instead, he saw a gleaming B-24, its nose painted with a grinning coyote. The American officer beside him smiled. We thought you might want to see what you used to laugh at. A mechanic opened the engine bay. The turbocharger, bolted to its manifold, began to spin up as the test rig came alive. First a low growl, then a shrill, rising wail. The turbine blurred into invisibility, glowing faintly orange at the edges. The sound rose higher and higher, until it became almost human, like the sky itself crying out. Brenner flinched, tears welling in his eyes. The American turned. You okay, pal? He swallowed hard. I mocked that sound, he said quietly. Now it mocks me. The other stepped back as the turbine screamed at full velocity. Instruments rattled. A coffee cup on the bench danced with each vibration. To the Americans, it was routine. Another test. To Brenner, it was revelation. He had spent years insisting that such a system would melt itself to pieces. Yet, here it was. Alive, howling, unstoppable. A sergeant laughed above the din. That sounds how we climb. 30,000 feet. Same power, same push. Brenner looked at the sky. He had designed planes that gasped at half that altitude. We thought the air belonged to us, he muttered, but you made it your servant. When the engine wound down, the field fell silent except for the clicking of cooling metal. The American officer handed him a rag to wipe his face. Funny thing, the man said. Every pilot says the same. That scream, it's how they know the plane's still fighting for them. Brenner nodded. And for us, he whispered, it's how we know we lost. For a moment, the two men stood side by side, enemies who suddenly shared the same language of sound and sky. Tell me, if you had mocked something all your life, and then one day heard it prove you wrong, would you have the courage to admit it? The war ended, but the sound never left him. Karl Brenner returned to a broken Germany, its factories hollow, its engineers scattered or absorbed by the victors. He found work difficult to come by. The once proud halls of Messerschmitt were now rubble and silence. When an offer came from Japan in 1950, a consulting role for a small manufacturer rebuilding its aircraft division, he accepted. The company was Mitsubishi. The journey took him across the Pacific, through Honolulu, then Yokohama. Everything smelled of salt and rebuilding. The same hunger he had felt once in his youth, now reborn in another defeated nation. His hair had turned gray, his confidence thin. But when he entered the workshop and heard the first whine of a test turbine, something in him stirred. The young Japanese engineers called him Brenna-san. They worked from blueprints left behind by American occupation authorities. Diagrams of GE turbos captured not as trophies, but as lessons. When they asked how to improve them, Brenner smiled faintly. You don't improve perfection, he said. You listen to it. In his small notebook, he wrote at night, I used to build engines that roared. Now I build ones that listen. Each word was drawn like a confession. He taught them to leave space for air, to let heat expand before constriction, to give machines what he called a chance to forgive. The result was Japan's first post-war jet turbine, the J-37. Not the fastest, not the strongest, but steady and patient, much like the man who designed it. One summer afternoon, as the engine roared to life, the tone was different, higher, purer, almost gentle. Brenner stood beside the test cell, wind tugging at his coat. His assistant, Hiroshi, asked, Is this right, Sensei? Brenner closed his eyes. The turbine's pitch rose, but instead of screaming, it sang. A whisper of control, not defiance. Yes, he said softly. Now it breathes. That evening, he lingered by the open window, watching the clouds drift over Mount Fuji. The sky was calm, yet he could still hear echoes of that first shriek in Texas. The sound that had once mocked him, now guiding his hands in quiet redemption. He realized the lesson had outlived the war. It was not about victory or defeat. It was about understanding the wind and building something that no longer fought against it. And as night fell, Carl Brenner smiled to himself, whispering, they taught me how to listen. 40 years later, the world had changed its skin. Jetliners now crossed oceans in silence compared to the roaring beasts of war. 
and few who once designed the engines of death were remembered by name. Yet in 1983, inside the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Dayton, Ohio, an old man moved slowly between displays of polished aluminum and oil-dark memories. Carl Brenner, 81, paused before a preserved B-24 Liberator, the same type whose scream had once humbled him. The hall was quiet, except for a faint hum of air conditioning and the echo of his cane on the floor. He reached out, resting his trembling hand against the nacelle of the engine. The metal was cool, silent, yet he could still feel its pulse beneath his palm. It's silent now, he murmured, but I still hear it. A young reporter from the Dayton Daily News, curious about the old visitor, approached. Sir, she asked gently, what did it sound like? Brenner smiled, not with pride, but with something gentler, older. Like pride breaking into respect, he said. The day I heard that sound, I realized the war was over. Not because of surrender, but because understanding had finally begun. He stepped back and looked around the hangar filled with the machines of every side, German, American, Japanese. Once they were enemies, now they were artifacts. The same air that once carried screams now carried tourists' whispers and the rustle of schoolchildren's notebooks. Outside, jet engines from Wright-Patterson's runway wailed faintly in the distance. A modern echo of the same physics, the same burning air, turned into lift. For Brenner, it wasn't noise anymore. It was continuity, proof that the sound he once feared had become the language of connection. He turned to leave, but not before whispering something no one heard, a private benediction for every engine that had ever fought to breathe. The museum doors closed behind him. The camera lingers on the turbine's curved blades, catching afternoon light, motionless, yet alive with memory. Then the faint whine of a distant jet rises and fades into silence. No music, no final words, only the sound of awakening that never truly stopped. History often remembers victories by maps and medals, but the real triumphs are quieter, found in the moments when understanding replaces arrogance. The turbocharger was never just a device of war, it was a symbol of how ingenuity can reshape belief. What began as laughter in a Stuttgart lab became reverence on a Texas airfield, and decades later, reflection in a silent museum. Carl Brenner's story was only one among thousands. Men who once competed to dominate the skies ended up collaborating to explore them. From the ashes of conflict rose an era of shared technology, jet engines born from the fusion of minds that once fought across continents. The scream of metal at 30,000 feet had turned into the calm whisper of flight paths and jetliners tracing peace above borders that once bled. The turbine, in its mechanical heart, taught something deeply human, that power means nothing without the humility to guide it. Nations that once sought supremacy discovered through the same machinery that cooperation could take them higher than conquest ever could. And so the story ends where it began, in the sky. But this time, it is not filled with the roar of warplanes, only with the soft murmur of engines carrying travelers home. Somewhere, perhaps, an old engineer still hears the echo, not of pride or defeat, but of respect shaped in the thin air above the world. <laughs>